If you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6, we're going to begin a new chapter. Uh, it is a much discussed chapter. It's probably the most controversial, contentious passage in the whole book of Hebrews. Uh, I am reading ahead. I have pages and pages to go through. I'm not trying to complain. I'm just saying this is the way it is. And, uh, and it's interesting to see how people interpret it. Uh, they, uh, the commentaries devote page after page to the first 12 verses or so. Most of the commentaries don't agree with one another. And I find myself arguing with almost every one of them uh, as we go through. So I don't know what we're going to do. We'll have to try to let the Bible speak. That's the main thing. It's one of those passages that is challenging because it seems to say something different from what other passages say. So then we have to reconcile those things together because it is all God's Word. So we have to understand it in light of everything God says, not simply in isolation. That is the problem because people sometimes not only are bringing to bear their, the other passages of God's Word, but they also have presuppositions and preconceptions uh, that, they are, that they hold to, and they will allow those preconceptions to dictate their interpretation rather than letting the Scripture interpret the Scripture. I think that's a failing. I, I, I'm, I, I, I can see it in other people. I'm sure I never do it myself. Right? So that's one of the problems when we're dealing with these difficult passages. Well, the first three verses are less controversial, but you, but you wouldn't know it from the commentaries. And even in church history, these first three verses, you're gonna, we're going to read something here in just a moment, and there is something here that caused two different Baptist groups to, to uh, form. And one group was the six principal Baptists, and the other group was the five principal Baptists. And they would not fellowship because they disagreed on one verse in Hebrews. That was it. Well, that's human nature, isn't it? And we need the grace of God to help us with these things. Uh, and I hope nobody divides over the six or five principles that we find here. All right, so what are we to do? Can we really even understand it? I think we can, and I think the basic meaning of these passages uh, of these opening verses especially, is to declare the author's purpose. So I've given our message this title, Authorial Intent, uh, Maturity. Maturity. So uh, that is his purpose. He wants his hearers to mature in the faith. Or hearers, I say, readers. Well, I suppose it could be hearers because some interpreters or commentators have noted that this book bears the marks of a sermon. So it may be actually a recorded sermon. They didn't have tape recorders in 2,000 years ago, but they could write things down. So that is that is possibly hearers or readers. In any case, this is what he is saying to them. And uh, let's read our passage, and then we can talk about what I mean by my title. All right, so for, uh, the first three verses of Hebrews 6. Now I'm going to come back. We're going to add in the last few of chapter 5 in just a minute, but I I want to read these first. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So that's our text for today. We're going to look in at every detail in it, but we'll get the drift of the purpose that he's stating here. Now, the this is a continuation of the argument from the last bit of chapter 5. One commentator said, the chapter break is both unwarranted and unfortunate. So as you're reading Hebrews, you do need to keep this in mind. I'm going to put these verses on the screen now. This is from 5.11 right through to Actually, the whole section goes to about verse 12 or 13 of chapter 6. It starts there, and it's all part of the same unit. And so we've been talking about these verses 11 through um, uh, whatever that is, 14, on, uh, in chapter 5 recently. And you'll notice that in verse 12 I've highlighted that phrase, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. 
And that ties in now, he brings that up. He said, he's, saying, uh, you are, he's saying to these people, you have, you have uh, in your spiritual growth, you've regressed. You should be teachers. You ought to be teachers. He says, you've become dull of hearing. You have become in the, to need milk and not solid food, and so on. You know those rebukes that we were looking at in the last few weeks. So then comes, therefore, therefore, leaving behind the elementary teaching about the Christ. He says, now you have need again for this, but we're going to leave it behind. Right? We're not going to talk about the elementary uh, things. We'll talk about that. what he means by that in just a moment. His purpose, though, is to move on, and he wants to stretch them and, uh, and call them to a deeper faith in Christ than they already have. So when I entitled my message, Authorial Intent, Maturity, that is just what he is setting out to do, carrying them along to maturity. And this is the purpose of Christian ministry. It's what the reason we gather is to build one another up. We use the term to edify, to, uh, uh, to strengthen, to encourage, to support. Uh, and we do that through various means. There's social interactions, there's spiritual interactions, there's the preaching and the singing and the praying and the evangelizing. All of these things that we do as Christians and as a church body and as a church together are meant to help you grow spiritually. It isn't just a religious club. We don't come here because, or it's not just a duty that we check off that box. All right, I made it to church this Sunday. I'm good for another week. That's not the way it works. If you think about it that way, you're thinking about church in the wrong way. What church is for, what the gathering is for, is to help you to grow into maturity as a mature believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, and Jesus commanded us to make disciples. And he expected us to actually do that. So our proposition today is this. The key to spiritual growth involves submission to God's will, not exerting our own will. Okay? The key to spiritual growth involves submission to God's will, not exerting our own will. Now, I think you'll see what I mean as we get to the end of the message, but that's what we're working on. So I'm going to have the passage on the screen, the three verses, and uh, if you have your Bibles, it's just as well to have that open. You can take notes and refer back and think about the words that are on your page or the ones that are on the screen. All of these are important. We're not going to cover, as I said, everything. The six principles that uh, starts with not laying again a foundation of repentance from the dead. We're not going to talk about them this Sunday. I'll pick those up next Sunday, and then you can decide whether you're going to separate from me because I hold to one or the other of these six principles, if they are six. Okay? All right. So our first point is this, the foundation of spiritual growth. And that is resting on this phrase, the elementary teaching of Christ. Now, I highlighted that phrase in chapter 5 and verse 12 uh, already, the elementary principles of the oracles of God. Now, one of my commentaries makes a distinction between these two terms, a slight distinction. Uh, and one, uh, he, he thinks of it perhaps, one could think of the uh, reference in chapter 5 and verse 12, the elementary principles of the oracles of God, as a very preliminary acceptance of the Bible as the voice of God. So that would be the very first step. And I think it's true that if you come to Christ, you have to accept that the Bible is the Word of God. Otherwise, how will you know about Christ? How will you know what is true? You do have to accept to some degree that what the Bible is saying is true. So that is certainly a first step. And then when we come to our passage here, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, uh, this could be something that goes a little bit beyond just receiving the Bible uh, and receiving Christ and the basics of Christianity in order to become a Christian. Now, I'm not sure how much of a difference there is between the two phrases. He is using two different terms, so possibly there's a difference. It's not, to me, a significant point. But here is the significance, I think, of what he's saying. He says, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ. This is, and then uh, he, then later he says, let us press on 
And then he says, not laying again a foundation. So the elementary teachings of Christ are the same thing as the foundation of repentance from the dead and so forth and faith. Now, um, I will, oh, I did, I guess I did have one remark I wanted to say about these six things before we go on. All right, so not laying again a foundation of repentance from, the, from dead works and of faith toward God, and then of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. All right, so the, um, uh, uh, these six founda- these are six foundational items. That's the idea behind these these phrases. One of them, you see that phrase of instruction about washings. The New American translates that word washings. The English Standard Version translates it washings. The King James translates it baptisms, as do some other uh, English translations. Now, it's a unique word. It usually refers to the Jewish washings. Uh, when, For example, in the Gospel of Mark, where they talk about the Pharisees washing their pots and their couches and all of these things, which is another passage. People say, what in the world? They're washing couches? Well, anyway, that is... It's, but that word has to do with Jewish rituals. And it is used two times in the New Testament, clearly referring to the Jewish rituals. Now, many people take from this verse... The idea that the uh, uh, that these things are not necessarily Christian elements; they could be Jewish elements. And in fact, one uh, very prominent radio preacher, internet preacher, in his commentary has said, has dismissed the whole argument of chapter 6, saying that basically he's talking about unconverted people as he's addressing uh, these people, and he's preaching to Jews. And he bases it, I think, primarily on the interpretation of this word. However, Colossians 2.12 says, having been buried with him in baptism, it uses this same word, in which you were also raised up with him through, the, through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Clearly, in Colossians 2, the word refers to Christian baptism. So, uh, the, uh, and the word is only used four times in the New Testament. So I find it very difficult to relegate all of this to the Jewish experience of the Hebrew Christians. I believe that he is writing to Christians, and he is calling them to leave behind or leave, or, uh, leave the foundation behind and move on. And so, uh, so I mention it because you will, if you will run across these things, especially this teaching, if you ever listen, I'm not going to tell you who it is. If I did, you would know him. Uh, you might run across his teaching, but I think they're pushing it too far because they want to avoid the problem that comes up in chapter 6, uh, verse 6, about the uh, uh, you can't renew them to repentance. So that's what they're trying to avoid. All right, I think it's too simplistic to do it that way. All right, uh, and besides this confusion with respect to this term, as I said, it is this con- the controversy over these six things that led to the formation of two different Baptist denominations. All right, so here's to sum up what I'm trying to say. The foundation of spiritual growth. The foundation and the elementary teaching speak to one thing, the starting point of of spiritual life. Right. So he says here in verse uh, 1, therefore leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ. And he also says, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith and so forth. All right, so Both of those phrases, that is the elementary, that is the beginning of spiritual life. At the beginning of spiritual life is repentance from dead works and faith towards God. At the beginning of spiritual life is teaching that informs about baptism and compares perhaps to the Jewish washings and setting apart to holy living. That's at the very beginning. When somebody comes to Christ, we will teach them that this means a new way of life. 
that they need to study the Bible, they need to learn to obey the Bible, they need to learn to submit to the Holy Spirit and to what the Spirit is teaching in the Bible. It's, everything's new. So this is the very basic elements of teaching about Christianity. And then uh, at the beginning of spiritual life is formed the hope of eternal life and escape of judgment to come. These are the very starting point of spiritual growth. You start here, you start with all of this, but now there's a new attitude you need to have. Preliminary attitude for spiritual growth. And I take that from the word leaving. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ. Not laying again a foundation. All right, So leaving it behind. Now there is a sense in the word leaving that means abandoning. Uh, leaving behind in the sense that you no longer follow it. That is not what he is teaching. When somebody becomes a Christian, they are leaving behind their old life, certainly. Their old ideas, their old culture. Uh, and in this sense, the old is replaced with the new. But here, the sense is uh, more progressive. So you leave it standing. We take the basics. We leave them standing. We leave them remaining in their place. We're going to go on to better and deeper and... and uh, more uh, developed things in our thinking. We're going to progress. We're called to advance from a starting point. We stand on a foundation. The foundation is Christ. The foundation are the doctrines, the basics, the beginnings of the Christian faith. But now we're building a structure around us. We aren't occupied constantly building the foundation. We are occupied with building on the foundation. What would you think if you were to watch, there's many construction projects around our city. Some of them uh, seem to be going up quite quickly. We sort of are astonished. I remember there was this, uh, for years, when we first moved here, this was, let's see, 1985. How, that's a long time ago. When we first moved here, there was a great big hole in, uh, on Hillside and Douglas. Does anybody remember that great big hole that was there? It was there for years. And what would you think if somebody, you know, all of a sudden you started to see some activity and you saw somebody going in and they're putting up forms and they start pouring the concrete and, uh, you know, and, oh, they're going to build something there. And so they take off the forms and let the concrete sit. And then a few months later they come in with the jackhammers and break it all up. And then they build another foundation. And uh, do the whole thing all over again. You say, oh, well, well, maybe they were wrong the first time. And so they, they start tearing off the forms and everything. And a few months later, in come the jackhammers. You think, what is with these people? You know, can they, how can they not get this right? You know, I mean, I mean, it is city building inspectors after all. But the thing is, <laughs> the thing is, I mean, how, what would you think if somebody was constantly building a foundation? Now, I want to say this. Sometimes there are churches that seem to be stuck on building foundations. They will say that they, are just, they just want to preach the gospel. And so every message you hear in the church is a good gospel message. Well, that's good. We want to preach the gospel. We want to invite the lost to come to Christ. We want them to hear that they can have eternal life through salvation and faith. But, you know, the Christians need something else too. The church is for the Christians. It's for building them up. And so, uh, so we need to do uh, something more than just preach the gospel. Well, we do need to preach the gospel. There are churches that don't even do that. Right? So we understand that's a problem as well. But what we're talking about here is there needs to be an attitude. We've got the foundations. Now we're going to let them sit. We're going to move on and learn some new things. That's what he's saying here in this passage. Remember, last week I said, if you don't progress spiritually, you don't just stand still, you go backwards. And I think that's true. That's what he's urging them about their spiritual life. Here, the Hebrew Christians, their temptation to go back into Judaism, he's saying, you need to leave the basics behind and press forward and get more. So we have to let the foundation stand and push forward. I have a quote here. From one of my commentaries, he says that the meaning here is not that of abandoning the basic teachings of Christianity, but rather the necessity of recognizing the foundational character of these teachings and thus the impropriety of going over the same ground. 
the readers are exhorted to move on to another level, a level commensurate with those who are mature. So that is the challenge. Hebrews is stretching us as we read it and think about it. We take it in. It is, it is challenging us to grow in our understanding of who Jesus is and what he did for us. It's very important. Now, we do want to call everyone who hasn't come to faith in Christ, believe in him. Accept him as the God-man who came to save you from your sins. Uh, receive eternal life from him. That is what you need. But, but, uh, but then also those who have received him, we need to keep moving forward in our spiritual growth. So the preliminary attitude, leaving the basic stand and moving on. That is the preliminary attitude. The next thing is the essential spirit, enabling uh, spiritual growth. And that I see in the word, let us Press on to maturity. Let us press on. This is the heart of the verse, of verse 1. No one should be satisfied with standing still. We should hunger for more. Delight, we should delight in more. Uh, uh, we, should, we should, well, Jesus said, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That's what we need to be. Uh, this philosophy lies behind our preaching here. Now, I know that my messages are not easy to follow at times. I try to make them easy to follow. I try to, but I, I am not dealing with simple topics. I want you to grow spiritually. I try not to use the highfalutin words. I do try to define them if I do use them, but I want you to grow. This ought to be, lie behind our daily devotional life. We should, we shouldn't, uh, you know, I'm not reading my Bible just to check off the boxes on my schedule. I have a little schedule, I have the little boxes, all right, I check off those boxes. Well, that's not my reason for reading the Bible. My reason is so that I can know God. I can learn something about Him. That's why I use the little exercise of having a notebook. And I don't write down, I write down the passages that I've, I'm going to read that day. And then after I've read them, I write myself a note. I've told you this before. Just something that the Lord taught me that day, or something that was emphasized, or something I noticed. And it's interesting. Sometimes it's from the New Testament, sometimes it's from the Old Testament, but the Lord speaks through His Word to my heart, and He will to yours. If you will make that your habit, we want to push forward. We want to. We want to be, uh, as he says here, pressing on to maturity. Now, there is something about this particular word, let us press on to maturity, that is, uh, that is unique. It's the voice, this is put into the active voice here in our translation, but it's actually in the passive voice. Now, one of the tra uh, commentators said, you could translate it this way, let us be borne along towards maturity, All right, to be carried along. The focus here is not on my effort. Now, there are things that I'm going to do to try to grow spiritually, but that isn't the focus that our attention ought to be. The passive voice means something is carrying us along. The commentator that said, suggested, let us be born along, said, as by the current of a stream. Another commentator, the thought is not primarily a personal effort. Let us go on, let us press, but a personal surrender to an active influence. What is the active influence? It's the Word of God. It's the Holy Spirit of God who's speaking to us through that Word. It is our Lord Jesus Christ. It's God in heaven, the Father, who, who are building in us that spiritual life. So what we are to do is to let God influence our thinking. Um, uh, so... There is, a, there is a tendency for us to sometimes tell God what he means when we read his scripture. And, and this is where often I've talked about these presuppositions or, or things that people want to impose onto the text as, we're, uh, as we talk about this passage that's coming up, very difficult to interpret. interpret. And I've noticed how some of them are, some uh, men are taking little bits of it and trying to make their scripture here fit their model of what it should say. We need to let it say what it says. 
We need to receive it. We need to let it form us and mold us. The essential spirit, enabling spiritual growth, is to simply let God speak to us. Let God speak to us. And then last, a four-point sermon today, spirit, the spiritual determination to leading to spiritual growth. Look at verse 3. This we will do. He said, now you, you have become as if you need the basics. That was what he said in chapter 5. Uh, five. You have become as if you need the basics. He says, but we're not going to do that. We are going to press on. We are going to leave standing the basics. We are going to press on or be pressed on. And we are not going to lay again a foundation. We are going to go forward. Uh, And it's interesting, by the way, there's an idiom with this idea, not laying again a foundation. The word is actually literally casting down. Sort of an interesting picture, word picture. If you take a foundation, you know, you, you put it down in the earth, but casting down. I thought that was an interesting way of saying it. But in any, in any case, in our idiom, we would say this, been there, done that. Okay, I, and We've already got the foundation. So now we aren't doing it again. We're moving on. We have a determination. The author has a determination to make progress. It would be one thing if the issue with these believers was a return to paganism. Then we would question the basics. Then we would review who Jesus is. We would review what salvation is. We would review all of those things. We'd go back to the foundation because the foundation perhaps was not laid. But these people are not being tempted by turning back to paganism. The issue with the Hebrews is a sidestep back to Judaism. There are similar doctrines between Judaism and Christianity. There is a similar lifestyle. There is the same God behind both, although the Jews have not recognized that God is doing a new thing through Jesus Christ, and they have largely rejected him. So, F.F. Bruce says, for the writer to go on insisting on these things, the basics, therefore would not really help them. It would be better to press on to those teachings which belong to spiritual maturity in the hope that the maturity would come with the teachings. In other words, what he's saying to them is, look, we're going to pre- this is what we're going to do. We're going to give you what you need, and we are hoping you will receive what you need. He is determined to press on from the basics to maturity. And then notice he, he emphasizes again dependence on God. If God permits. One commentator said this is not to be understood as a merely pious convention. The development of the Christological structure of the foundational articles as well as the attainment of the goal of spiritual maturity places both the writer and his audience in dependence upon the blessing of God. We sometimes will attach a phrase to our plans for the future. Uh, Lord willing, we're going to do such and such. Lord willing. We don't want to be presumptuous. But here, the author is reminding us, our growth depends on God's spirit and God's grace. This we will do if God permits. And so I want to focus on the proposition. The key to spiritual growth involves submission to God's will, not exerting our own will. Now note that I said spiritual growth here, not Christian growth. I want to make this message one that appeals both to the person who is not a believer and one that appeals to a Christian. For a believer, for excuse me, for an unbeliever, the one converting to Christ has to submit to Christ's will. You have to submit to what God says. I suspect that the difficulty in winning souls to Christ lies right here. We, what happens is you, you might be able to teach somebody about the facts about Jesus Christ, about the fact that he came uh, into the earth as a, a virgin-born, uh, sinless baby, grew up as a sinless young man, lived a sinless life, and then died as a criminal on the cross. 
And you might be able to explain to them the theology of substitution, the fact that Jesus became the substitute for your sins. He bore the penalty of your sins. You can explain all those facts, and someone can and can understand what those facts mean. But in order, until they will submit their wills to God's will, they will never be converted. They will never be converted. If you are an unbeliever, you hear the preaching, you've heard the stories, you've uh, understood the facts, but you have never submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Would this, would today be the day for you to say, all right, yes, Lord, I want to start with you. Yes, Lord, I want to receive you. Yes, Lord, I want to believe. As the one man said to Jesus, help thou mine unbelief. Right? I hope there's somebody who would say that as they hear the word preached. But this message is also for believers. Spiritual growth is for believers. It requires our constant Submission to the word as well. We can't assume, oh, I've got it made. I've arrived as a, as a Christian. I've hit the plateau. I'm as mature as I'll ever get. Okay, you can't come in with presuppositions. You know, <clears throat> this often happens when we learn a theological system. You know, there's, there are theological systems that are helpful for understanding the Bible. I subscribe to various systems of thinking about the Bible. And it is very, very difficult when I come across a passage that doesn't seem to quite fit my system. And I have to say the Bible is true and however there's something wrong with my system if I can't accept it. I have to accept what the Bible says, not impose my will on the Bible. That's how I grow. That's how I come grow, uh, grow have... Uh, increase in, and uh, maturity in Christ. The Bible talks about being renewed by the washing of the water with the Word. The Word of God is that thing which matures you. Spiritual growth happens through submission. And I hope that truly the Holy Spirit of God will speak to you today. And if there's some area of life that God is challenging you, that you would submit to Him. Don't argue with Him. Submit to Him. Receive what he has to say to you today. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this passage and the emphasis that it has. Lord, I pray that as we, uh, as we serve you, that you would truly do a work in our hearts that we might believe you and be faithful to you in all things. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.